Okay, good afternoon or evening or morning, depending on where in the world you are. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, the US Trail Running Conference webinar series. And my name is Terry Chiplin. I'm the, uh, uh, I'm the event director for this webinar series. And uh, um, we were welcoming uh, people from uh, across the world on this webinar. And uh, we're really honored. This is quite an international um, participant panelists we have here. Um, we have representation from, uh, from New Zealand, um, from the United States and from, um, from England as well. Um, so uh, welcome to uh, one and all here. And uh, um, we're gonna be covering uh, the important subject of, uh, um, of, we're calling it the global campfire. Um, which was a, a name that uh, um, Anna up in the top left here um, uh, conjured up, but I think uh, sums up pretty well. Um, that uh, looking at mental health and how, how we can help um, mental health communities um, that are struggling with uh, um, helping them in terms of uh, encouraging them to exercise and run and walk. And then how we can encourage those people to, uh, to join the trail running community as well. So. Um, we've got a, a big community we're representing here. Um, and uh, without further ado, um, uh, I want to uh, share, uh, I'm just going to share a screen here. So, a big thank you to our presenting sponsor, Marathon Printing. And uh, um, yeah, we just want to say a big thanks to them. They're, uh, um, they've been an amazing supporter for the conference. Uh, and for this webinar series. And um, the, they're, for those of you that don't know, they're actually based in the, um, in the United States, but they're a, a family owned company that specializes in producing custom printed items for endurance sports. And race bibs are their most popular item, either custom printed or stock bibs. And Marathon Printing also supplies vital accessories for race directors like pins, bags, and pennant flags as well as postcards, business cards, brochures, bumper stickers, and labels. And uh, we are very, great, very grateful to Ryan Zerk and the team at Marathon Printing for their support of this webinar series. And without their support, then we wouldn't be able to bring you this webinar series and, and, uh, um, and make sure that everybody can access these webinars for free. So, uh, um, so big, thanks to, uh, uh, big thanks to them. So, um, so going back to uh, um, my screen share, um, uh, I can do that. Then, oh, wait one second. This is, as I said, Global Campfire, how supporting mental health can, uh, and can grow your race. And so big thanks to everybody on the, um, on the webinar here. And um, just a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, we're going to, actually I haven't done that yet. So I'll need to do that now. Um, all right, so I think chat should be enabled now. Um, so feel free to uh, um, leave any comments in chat for us. And we've also got the Q&A um, Q mechanism, the platform there working for you as well. So um, feel free to put any questions um, in as we're going through and we'll do our best to get to them um, as we're actually moving through the program. Um, so if, uh, if we could do a, um, a quick wave for everybody, we're not gonna do full introductions at this moment, um, but uh, um, Anna Christoforo from Speed Freaks, Okay, Hi. thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris Pike from Crazy Rim Trail Run. Yeah. And Mal Law from the Wild. Good morning. Yeah, well, Mal, good morning. And Sarah Strong from Bigger Than the Trail. Yay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, Kim Levinsky from Sasquatch Trail Running. Hey there. Yeah, hey. And Claude Umuhai from the Running Charity in London. Hey, Claude, thank you so much for being here. Okay, so I'm gonna be the, uh, the moderator for the evening, um, but uh, um, I'm gonna stop this share now, and I'm going to play a short video um, with... I see Speed Freaks as life-saving, and for me to be able to be a part of that, it uh, means a world to me. Um, help me to fully engage and to maybe express my thoughts and my feelings, which hasn't come easy for me. You know, the old man was, didn't talk about that sort of stuff. 
to connect with people that, that only want the best for you and will help you make that a safe space. No expectations. It's just been real good, especially for what I'm going through um, at the moment with my journey of recovery, of discovery, actually. In my early recovery, the two main things that helped me were the connection and then also fitness. They know that you were not being paid to be there. So you're turning up out of your own time because you want to be there. I think that's so special. Yeah. And we all have had a crisis at some stage. We've all really, really struggled. I know what it felt like when I needed to be supported or have someone by me. You don't have to counsel people who are struggling with their recovery. You just be there. We're just all completely different people doing this common goal together, talking about running, which is fantastic. <laughs> One of the coaches, Lee, asked how things were, and I said to him, brother, I'm not really keen on talking, I just want to run. And he goes, well, let's run then. But just knowing that they're there is a mean thing, so that if we want to talk, we can talk. Just the inclusion is heaps of love there, though. One of our community runners, he said, I used to have this judgment on people that had been to prison, but since joining the Speed Leaks, it's really changed my perception of that. So some of the amazing impacts I've seen is really the ability for people to want to give back. Today we're doing, uh, we're volunteering, so we get a lot out of the park run, so it's nice to be able to give back and help out here today. You could be on duty and just be a marshal or, or one of the timekeepers. It doesn't really matter what what part you play in it, it's just a huge pleasure to be involved in. The Speed Freaks is embedding with the wider community and bridging that discrimination and that stigma from both sides, and it's a beautiful thing to hear. The world that, that I've sort of come from, no one really, no one does anything for nothing. I was sort of like waiting for the catch. To meet a lot of people that, that are really, really kind and, and only want the best for you. Brother, it's actually restored my faith in humans that, that there's good people around. We've also seen people really being able to sustain a lot more of their recovery by joining the Speed Freaks. I haven't found anything that's really pushed me through to the other side of addiction. Apart from this, I think exercise is the antidote to, to addiction. Grace has been coming to our community run every Tuesday and she's been juggling her work and also her role as a mum and also her own journey of recovery. I feel immensely proud and just really inspired by her. I see Speed Freaks as life-saving and for me to be able to be a part of that, it, it means the world to me. It's redirected my life and I can't wait to be able to give back. Okay, wonderful, wonderful video, Anna. Thank you for uh, thank you for letting us share that. Um, so Anna and Chris, you're going you're going to lead uh, lead out uh, um, representing New Zealand. So uh, um, yeah, really looking forward to uh, hearing your story. Okay, thanks for sharing that film. That that that's our most most recent film. Um, I'm Anna, and I'm the the founder of the Speed Freaks Charitable Trust um, and a program director and a social worker of 25 years who's worked in addiction and mental health. Um, and um, that little run group started in 2017 when I was operations manager at Odyssey House. And um, Odyssey House will be familiar to people in the US because that's where it started. And there's Odysseys, I, I believe, in um, New York, Salt Lake City, Houston, a couple of others, Odyssey House in Australia as well. And we started a small run group in 2017, um, just to get out of the house really. And um, it was one of the most impactful groups that we had. And in, in my 25 years of, of doing addiction work, one of the areas that we really struggle with as, as clinicians is um, integration. And um, that first group was guys straight out of prison. And what I saw quite simply was what we hadn't been able to achieve in all my years of doing that, doing this work. So um, 
I left my job uh, two years ago and started the charity. And we now have 23 groups running each week in Christchurch and Auckland. We're just onboarding to other areas in New Zealand. Um, we have a team of nearly 70 volunteer coaches um, that deliver our program and 10 peer volunteers who've been through our program. Um, and a very small staff team who kind of coordinate everyone. But one of the biggest things for us has been, you saw in that film there, a park run takeover. And um, that film is really special because what we thought we were doing way back in 2017 was running. Actually, it was nothing to do with running. It was to do with um, inclusion and connection. And um, to, to my mind, that's one of the biggest unmet health needs that we have is inclusion and connection. And um, to be able to um, open up a gap and ask people to step in that gap and see really unlikely relationships form that some of our runners have been running with us since 2017. They're still running with us. Um, they are part of the running community and we see people proudly running individually in their Speed Freaks t-shirts, but we also see people moving away from us and becoming members of the running community without um, the support of us in the background. And, and that's a real privilege to see. Um, and one of the partnerships that we've had um, have been with some of our local races and um, the Crater Rim is one of those. Um, and for us, those partnerships afford so much. And I suppose for today, what I would love event organizers and race directors to take away is that actually they have such a powerful tool to affect change, um, such a powerful tool to support people in their recovery. And I think we sit, it, we sit on it and we don't see you don't see what you don't know, right? And I have got so many stories, as I'm sure everyone has here, and all the other charities globally that are doing this work, and there's many of them, so many stories that are um, tear jerkers, that, are, that make you laugh, make you cry, um, but they're all about how we weave connection and, and sustain recovery through those pro-social connections and um, um, really give people some agency over their life, really. Um, and that's Speed Week's magic. It's running charity magic. Um, it's, you know, it's happening everywhere. So um, I also just want to acknowledge everyone else that's doing this that isn't on this webinar, um, but um, are working really, really hard to um, support people. So, yeah, that's that's our perspective. Um, Chris, do you want to talk a bit about the Crater Rim and then I can... Um, yeah, I can I can go on for ages if you want. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I'm Chris St. Pike and I'm part of the organising team for the Creator Rim Ultra. Um, we're based in Christchurch in the South Island of New Zealand. Um, just basic info on the event, we've got five trail distances ranging from 10k through to 80k. Approximately 650 to 700 people entering year on year at the moment. Um, the event's hosted by Port Hills Athletic Club, I must say. Um, can't do it without the club. Um, and the, the event is purely a, a, a social positive and fundraising event. Um, every cent that's generated from the event is donated back into the uh, community to support running, outdoor activities, um, and the land that we use to, to do this. Um, I'm going to go on. I'm going to say quite a lot here, probably, but um, it's worth saying, I think. Um, the event supports and involves um, numerous charities um, and trusts and all our aid stations and our staff by char charity organisations, um, all based in that sort of outdoor connection inclusion um, sector. Um, and one being Speed Freaks, who obviously we're here with today and we've been working together now, I think, Anna, for what, four years-ish? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 2019, 2019, yeah. Um, yeah, as, as Odyssey, Odyssey House originally, I think, but yep. yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it all started, we just reached out to numerous local running charities, well, running orientated charities um, to gauge interest in being involved and the response was amazing. Um, at the early stages, we didn't really even realize what we had or how we were going to align trail running even further with the mental health benefits, but 
working with um, Speed Freaks, um, it was soon apparent that we'd, we'd struck on something good. And from the first event, event of their uh, involvement, the community welcomed welcomed all our charities with amazing support. And even in some, especially with Speed Freaks, in some normally challenging situations. But yeah, um, they weren't a problem for our um, our trail running community here in Christchurch. Um, there's all sorts of amazing things that come out come out of the event. Um, being involved with the charities on a pro social angle. Um, but one thing that we do see, and I think I will agree, um, is the Speed Freak participants, I'm basing this on the Speed Freaks today, sorry, but the Speed Freak participants, have, they've been to some dark places in the past, um, and this seems to give them amazing perception of the pain and, and the low spirits of a trail runner, especially when you hit that pain cave. Um, and this prior experience seems to help the participants support the runner in continuing to achieve their goal for the day. Um, so simply there, we've got a two-way support system has been created, a brief conversation, a, a you can do it, mate, and a now nah, you can do it, mate, situation. And it's a social connection. And it's been made there on an aid station. Um, uh, where else would we, we create that connection? Um, you're definitely not going to create that at some sort of meet and greet or a check, you know, a charity check presentation ceremony. Um, and here at the A station, we've got the beginnings of a full, um, like a full circle of support, connection and inclusion. And, and that's just from two people standing at an aid station. So Anna, do you want to add anything to that part? Yeah, that I'll, I'll, I can add a lot. Eight, yeah, aid part. stations. Aid stations are where it's at. So um, for the creator room, we um, over the years, we've weaved this relationship, which is really important. So we have our runners and coaches when they participate in a in a trail event, because we're so good at walking on concrete, but we're pretty rubbish at walking on the trails when we haven't had that experience. And so the, the whole from the moment of registration and the excitement of getting your running pack and building it and, and, and training in it, uh, right through to um, getting to know the, um, the race and the, the race director and the team. Um, and then we agree a race um, uh, aid station. And the aid station are allow people in residential programs that are running curious, but a bit apprehensive to get involved. And they have no idea what an ultra is gonna be like. <laughs> And we start at, you know, ridiculous time of five in the morning or even earlier setting up and we do slots with residential programs. They do four hour slots and then they come and we swap the residents around. And um, generally people don't want to leave their shift once they've got there and they've experienced it. And and as Chris was saying, you know, it's a, I mean, I, I didn't run last year. I, I helped supported the aid station, but the conversations that happen are it's a privilege to hear and um we you know we we had uh yeah as chris said a situation where we had we you know we had a patch some patch gang members that were out helping on the aid stations and the most unlikely relationships um and support forming as they sort of saw people coming through really struggling and were like look you know you've got this if you know i can do this you can do this and we're going to get you to the finish line um, and and that's where those people then come back and say, do you know what? Can we? Can I try walking? Can you take me on up to the hills? And and so it starts from there. And then for the race itself, we have people entered from 10k right through. This year we've got I think three people that are going to enter the 53k. And so they might have done that event a couple of years ago as aid station. And then they'll try a 10k and so it moves forward and um it's a it's a long-term relationship with the crater room but it's one that is really important and pays dividends because we've now you know our runners are in the community living their own lives and and identify as being part of part of the crater room ultra and that's magic basically yeah yeah yeah, and and if you don't know the speed freaks in Christchurch, then yeah, you must um I'd say you live under a rock. <laughs> <laughs>
um, yeah. Um, so I'll just, we're obviously a bit, a bit basic here at Race Directors and, and the benefits of working with these charities, there's obviously lots of whole social gain um, from working with the likes of Speed Freaks and Achilles and Adventurous Bar now here in Christchurch. Um, and we love that, but we also value the operational benefits of working with charities. So I'm just going to push a little bit on that. Um, they weren't apparent when we first started working for charities, but it was soon a soon, uh, evolution um, that has worked for both of us. So we found that charities are organized people. They spend their days organizing people, um, the organized teams. Um, so basically, when it comes to an aid station, we can hand that over to one person. They go and train the team. They return with a trained team. And I've heard they've had some great trip on having their uh, aid station training nights. Um, but yeah, they come as a prepared team. So that's a massive organization element taken out for us. Um, and it avoids obviously having to train them individual members to create an aid station team. Again, with the charities, we've got people who are working there that have they've got compassion and support and care for people. And um, what an amazing resource to have at an aid station when you've got struggling runners, you know? Um, you know just keep their spirits up, keep them going. So. Um, and again, normally our charities are running and outdoor based charities, so they understand um, people's needs when they're out in the hills and out on the trails and yeah, they've probably been in some of them situations themselves. So again, that sort of experience, you know, keeps everyone feeling included in the event, keeps everyone supported and, and helps most people to the finish line. <laughs> I'd say most, nearly everyone. Um, so I've got heaps of positive um, operational financial, social benefits um, to discuss, but I think we're a bit limited in time and we're probably going on and on here, but um, so our focus really at the Creator Room it is, has always been to encourage people to, to get outdoors and get running for numerous health connected benefits, but um, the involvement of the, the charities we work with and their members, their participants, their, um, their volunteers, um, it just helps us push on with our goals in a totally new new direction. Um, and we've taken the subject of mental health, we've put it up front, uh, it's on show um, at the Creator Room, there's, there's absolutely no hiding. Um, yeah, it's yeah, it's a great platform that we sort of, yeah, came up on, yeah, unknowingly really. Um, but yeah, the inclusion of all our charities added so much to the event. Um, and yeah, we sort of look forward to where we go next with it. Um, but Ooh. yeah, I'm not sure where we go next, but I'm sure between Anna and we'll, Achilles, we'll think, and of something. Anna, we'll think of something and you will we'll think of something. Level. <laughs> you've got you've got this far, so I'm sure there won't be any problem carrying on. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Thank you, Chris and Anna. Um, that was wonderful. And uh, um, Chris, I really appreciate you uh, um, kind of including the uh, um, the race director perspective there. And, uh, um, and and Anna, I don't know if you could if you can see this on the chat as well, but uh, um, Jenny Wolf. Um, has oh, said, yes. yeah, you're an inspirational and charismatic leader um, and awesome transformational results towards anti-discrimination and fantastic adjunct to treatment. And so, oh. uh, yeah, yeah. So that's obviously somebody who knows you, uh, knows you pretty well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. somebody in the field. Yeah. Cool. yeah. There's lots cool. of, lots of great work going on. I'm really excited to hear everyone else's, everyone else's journeys. Yeah, yeah. So um, please feel free to ask any questions as we um, as we go through. I will also share um, uh, I'm doing a recording of this and that will be available tomorrow. Um, so I'll share that recording with everybody who's um, not on the live mm -hmm. webinar now, but will be able to get to see the recording tomorrow. Um, and I'll also include um, the contact information for each of our panelists here as well on that information too. Um, so, um, so please feel free to, uh, um, you know, if you're if you're a bit shy about reaching out here, then um, you can always reach out by um, by email offline as well. Um, so, Mel, let's uh, um, let's let's hear a bit about uh, about your story, mate. If you're ready for that. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, I'm going to kick off with a couple of apologies. First of all, sorry if there's any glint off the glasses from the very inadequate lighting that I'm working with, but um, can't see a bloody thing without them. So I just have to put up with that. Um, and I keep getting an occasional message saying my internet uh, connection is unstable, which is kind of appropriate because I'm unstable as well, but hopefully that is not to the uh, detriment of the webinar. 
Um, yeah, so my running journey is um, is a very long one. Um, I first started trail running some 30 years ago. And only very recently have I arrived at a place where I am becoming an event director. Um, that's very new to me. So in between, there's been, there's been quite a lot of action. Um, and uh, I start, first started running for charity uh, 14 years ago. I did my first big fundraising challenge. And the first couple I did, which were both sort of week-long um, ultra, back-to-back -back ultra through the mountains type runs, uh, where I invited lots of people along to join me and help with the fundraising. They were both for the Leukemia Foundation here in New Zealand, um, simply because my brother died of leukemia when I was a little lad, uh, and that left a lasting mark on me. Um, but one of the other big formative um, experiences in my life was losing my brother-in-law to suicide. And um, I was actually the person that found him, and he had chosen to take his life in a fairly way which um yeah, again has left a quite, quite a legacy um so i had always thought at some point in my life i'd like to do something um by way of a fundraiser um and consciousness raiser for the mental health cause so back in 2012 i ran 16 days around the southwest coast path in the uk um, the only time in my life I've owned a, an FKT and it didn't last long. <laughs> um, and that, uh, that raised uh, uh, some money for the Mental Health Foundation here and also the Mind Charity in the UK. Claude might well know of that. Um, and then uh, 2015 is probably the, the one I'll talk about the most. It's, it's the, it, it was the, the, the big fundraiser in, in, in my life. Um, I came up with this rather ridiculous notion of 50 mountain marathons up 50 peaks in 50 back-to-back -back days and choosing to do those all around New Zealand with the logistical uh, nightmare of traveling between these, these regions. A really stupid idea, I have to say, in hindsight. Um, but um, I, rather than just doing that with my own little support crew and running solo each day, I invited people to join me on each and every day on the condition that they raised at least $400 for the charity. Um, so we ended up with over 300 people joining in that run, uh, well, those runs, and we raised, um, in the end, we made, a, we made a film out of that. Um, if anyone actually wants to get a link to that film, um, put them in touch, Terry, and I'll, I'll give you a, a download link for free. Um, uh, but all that, we raised over half a million dollars for the Mental Health Foundation uh, through, through that project. And that taught me an awful lot about the, the, the power of running and the to do some, do some good in the world. Um, and I think more than anything else, you know, it, was, it, it had always, I'd always known, everyone knows that being active um, and, and getting out running is good for your mental well-being. But very much like you've talked about, Anna and Chris, um, I think the, the big learning was that all the sort of hidden benefits of, of that activity that I hadn't really been cognizant of beforehand. Um, that whole thing around connection, just people connecting with one another. And I know on each of those days, there were conversations going on amongst people about their own mental struggles, maybe with someone that they knew that was having a mental struggle, um, people, like me, had lost people to to, to suicide. Um, we even had some people who had been suicidal and signed up to join the challenge because they thought it might help them dig, dig them out. And we've got a couple of really amazing success stories of people who turned their life around completely because they were because because they were part of this thing, and it's such a sense of inclusion and connection was was massive. Um, I have continued uh, down the years to do some other more more fundraising stuff. Um, I don't go don't need to go into the the details of those, but um, mental health has been the, the the main the mainstay of my fundraising activities. Um, and then that's just starting to sort of take a slightly different path now. Um, so back in 2018, I came over to, went over to the States 
to Colorado uh, I'd always been and intrigued by the Hard Rock 100 race and wanted to see it up close and personal. Um, and during that time, I did a, 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 um, a fast pack around the Hard Rock course. So I did a soft rock as it's, as it's known. And um, that just ignited my passion. Um, and I thought, gosh, you know, we've got amazing mountains in New Zealand and it's a place that people want to come and, and run. Uh, and yet we don't actually have a, a, a hundred mile at quite like hard rock. We do have some hundred mile races, but a lot of them are involved running around and around in loops, uh, rather than a, a beautiful, pure mountain journey. So I started working on this idea. Gosh, yeah, straight, away, straight after that. So it's been five years in the making already. And December this year, six months away, we're finally actually getting to stage the first edition of what I have called the wild. Um, for various reasons, we're not doing the 100 mile edition of that in the first year, but we are doing five other distances leading up to 50 miles. And to administer and deliver that event, we've set up a, a charitable trust and it's called the Wild for Nature Charitable Trust. And this is what I really want to talk about is the, the slight divergence in, in where I've gone on my, on my journey of running for mental health is my, I don't call it a newfound belief, I've always known about it, but I've, I've become more and more evangelical about it, is the role that nature plays in that. So not just activity, not just being with other people on trails, but actually being immersed in nature and giving back to help nature. Um, I mean, we, and I'm sure you're all aware of all the you know, forest bathing benefits and, and things like that. Um, so the vision for the event is that uh, we provide people with an epic running experience through epic mountains. But the proceeds from that all get fed back into habitat restoration work in the area through which people are running. Um, and hopefully we get the, the, the tribe, the community of people who become part of this event and grow as a family over the years. Chris, you'd know how these families build around, around an event, um, that we actually get them involved in the work as well. So my, my, my dream is that people run the course, they start to see some of the work we're doing with green planting and uh, control and days of speed and they, uh, they, they get interested in, 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 in that whole thing around rewilding. And maybe when they go back to their home country, their home region within New Zealand, they see opportunities to get involved there. Um, but also um, if they live within the region where, where, we, um, where the, upper, the, the run happens, which is in um, Arrowtown near the adventure capital of Queenstown, um, that they come out with us on working bees and get involved in, in, in conservation work on, on the area through which the, they're running. Um, so, yeah, so for me, um, the, that connects back. So it's not, this is not just purely a conservation story. It is actually, it builds on everything I've done in the mental health space before as well, because um, I always go back to the, like the five, the five, what's called the five winning ways to wellbeing, um, which were developed, I think, originally in the UK uh, and were adopted by the New Zealand Mental Health Foundation. Um, and one of those is be active. I and mean, well-established links between activity and, and mental well-being. So that one's a bit, a bit of a, uh, a, a bit of a no-brainer. Connect is one of those five. And obviously we've talked about connection and how getting people together to connect with others and talk through their problems or just enjoy one another's company is an amazing thing. Uh, give, giving your time and your attention to others. It's amazing the mental health benefits that come from, like you, <laughs> trail running, ultra running is a fairly selfish and um, lonely sport at times. But if you get involved in some kind of activity where you use it to give back, be that to generate funds or in, in our case, to take part in an event where you know that, or, or like the Creative Room, where you know that the proceeds are going back into the community for good, good work. That actually has a personal benefit to the runner. 
in terms of their own mental well-being because it makes them feel good about themselves. Um, but the, the, the two that I think really sort of come to life when you start putting people into a nature setting to do their running um, is this. This is a very important tenet of, of the five ways to, to, to well-being. And for me, taking notice is about fully activating all five senses. And I think as runners, we tend to probably use sight, definitely, a little bit of sound. But how often do we actually stop to smell and touch and feel um, and, um, and listen to the birds and what have you? So I see this as a, I see this as a, a really good advantage, uh, opportunity to encourage people to um, start to actually feel the benefits of being in nature rather than just going out for a run. I mean, the two incorporate with each other nicely. So the more we can regenerate nature through, through our efforts uh, with, with an event like this, the better. And the other one, the other final tenet of the mental health, um, the five ways to wellbeing is, is keep learning. And, um, you know, this is, this is why I find really important personally. I, I tend to stagnate um, very quickly. I move on from one project to another with, with some frequency. Um, but if you, yeah, so it's always that, that always remaining curious, always, always looking for new things, new passions, new ways to get in, new things to be interested in and uh, keep, keep the brain active. And, you know, for me, I, I think uh, trail runners, I love, you know, I'm, <laughs> I love trail runners. I love everything about the sport, but I think we can actually do more as a, as a community to give back to, to nature. And in actually challenging ourselves to learn more about native ha habitat restoration, learn more about how through, as runners, we can benefit nature and the environment, we are again getting a personal benefit because we're learning. We're learning all the time about, oh, that's a, that's a new species that, that I, hadn't, I hadn't been able to recognize before. And you know, they're very subtle little um, reinforcers, but they're very, very important to individuals' mental well-being. So this for me is, this for me is now the, the intriguing challenge moving forward is, is to incorporate almost two causes in one, if you like. There's the I'm very, very passionate about rewilding and the, the benefits of that to give nature a helping hand. But I know that through doing that, that we're actually creating great opportunities for people to work on their own mental well-being as well. So I guess, you know, I'm not here to tell people to teach uh, event directors how to suck eggs, but I would just urge any event director to think about what are the opportunities for the way in which they run their race, where they run their race, how they run it. Um, to think, how can we, yeah, how can we offer the opportunity for people to get, get well-being benefit beyond that of being active um, through 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 their events, um, and that's pretty much my story today. Lots more to come, hopefully. Cool, Mal. Thank you, thank you so much. And um, and I was reminded while I was listening to you that uh, it, it's just about eight years ago that uh, first met you in Colorado too. So mm, yes, yeah. yeah. What so a fateful day that was. <laughs> yeah, well, indeed. Um, and uh, thank you. Your your uh, your unstable connection just about hung in there. We we lost you a few times, but uh, um, oh. but we we got the, we got the most of it. So uh, so thank you so much, Mal. Um, okay, Kim, Kim and Sarah, let's uh, let's move across to the United States now. And uh, um, yeah, if you guys can uh, um, can take over, and uh, um, Sarah and Kim, if you could uh, tell us your story of what's happening in the United States. Sure, I'll jump in here. Um, so I I am here in Colorado. I and my like my job is I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I do um, trail based therapy sessions with my clients. So integrating both movement and nature that really resonated with me. Um, I really believe in sort of the healing power of both of those things, and so I use that all day in my my real life. But here I'm talking about bigger than the trail. Um, and I am a volunteer for Bigger Than the Trail, as is everyone who's associated with it. So um, everything that we have done and everything we are doing is um, with volunteers. And so um, I'm very proud of all of the things that we've done. We don't quite have 
maybe some of the numbers that Speed Freaks has. I'm so inspired by everything that you all are doing. Um, but we are like a small and mighty crew here in our corner of the world. Um, and what we're doing is a little bit different. So instead of helping people become aware of the powerful mental health benefits of running, we are helping running communities feel comfortable in talking about mental health and saying that sometimes running isn't enough to take care of our mental health. So we might be active runners and be training and doing all this great stuff and still have depression and still have anxiety and still have OCD. And um, in a world where people say running is my therapy, we are trying to give people language to say, running is really great for my mental well-being and I also go to therapy and I also take care of my mental health in other ways. And so what we've done is created a community of volunteers um, who really like prim primary goal is creating community and reducing stigma. So saying um, exactly what I just said, like, hey, it's okay if you're running and you also don't feel great, even though you're running all these miles, like that's okay. Um, and then bringing those folks together as ambassadors and they're fundraising. And with that money, we're able to connect people who reach out to mental health services. So anyone, runner or otherwise, can reach out to Bigger Than The Trail and say, hey, I need support and we can connect them to a free month of virtual therapy. And so far we've provided 1,400 free months of virtual therapy, which is pretty cool. Um, and we are a group of volunteers. I happen to be a clinician. There are some clinicians in our um, group here, but that's really not what we do. We're not providing the services um, or we haven't been. And one of the big sort of exciting things that um, I'm really proud of this year is we've trained a number of the ambassadors to be peer group facilitators. And so now we have a weekly peer support group because before, you know, the only thing we were able to offer is this monthly individual therapy. And that's not what everybody's looking for, right? Some people are just looking for community. Some people are just looking for some resources. And so this is a way that we're able to empower ambassadors, many of whom are coming to Bigger Than the Trail because they have their own story and journey with mental health. And we're empowering them to have some skills to provide support and create community. Um, so yeah, that's what we're doing. We are, it's very grassroots. It's very much volunteer run and, and led and, um, new, like the peer support group thing. I think we're like week five or six. So it's really, um, brand new, but people like it. I mean, what we're finding the first year, you know, we had a few people reach out and now it's hundreds of people and we've got hundreds of volunteers reaching out to become ambassadors, applying to become ambassadors. And so seeing that need, like people um, don't want to, the, the tagline for Bigger Than The Trail is shine a light on mental health. And I think people don't want to be in the dark alone in their journey. And we, I hope, are giving space and language to provide community and connection like everybody's been talking about so that people aren't alone in that. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Kim, could you, uh, would you mind sharing your story? Because uh, um, you're, you've been through a, a program with Bigger Than The Trail. So please tell us more about that. Sure, yeah. Um, it's cool to hear Sarah talk about uh, the runners that are getting involved because that describes me to a T. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it's cool to be on here and have this conversation. Uh, it was really neat to see this as a topic for the series. So I just want to say thanks to Terry and uh, everybody organizing it. It's cool to be here to chat about all this going on. Um, I do want to preface by saying I have a cat who's very dramatic and she might photobomb the Zoom because she's known for that. Um, but anyway, I think like a lot of people, uh, trail running has been incredibly transformative. Uh, in my life, I first got involved in running about 10 years ago after college athletics ended. I was involved in college sports, and uh, I had that structure in my life for a long time, and then it was gone. And so uh, I got involved with running, and I've got the all-in addictive personality. So I went from like couch to half marathon to marathon to 50K to 50 mile. Very quickly, I was chugging the Kool-Aid, uh, probably like a lot of other runners, and um, when I first got into running, I was kind of that lone wolf of like, I was doing all my training alone, 
I was going to races by myself. Uh, and I found it was very easy to get lost in the crowd, uh, show up at these events and then kind of get lost in the shuffle of the race. Um, and it wasn't until I had gotten involved with trail and ultra running that that started uh, to change. So I moved back to New Jersey in 2016. I'd been living in Ohio for a number of years. And uh, that's when things started to change for me was when I got plugged in with the local uh, trail and ultra community. Cause I met people that uh, they thought different than me and they were very comfortable talking about everything and anything beyond just like pooping in the woods. You know, there were topics like mental health that it just, it created this safe space and an open environment that I hadn't experienced before. Um, and it was because of that, that I started to ask questions about my own story. And I think looking back, depression is something that I've struggled with on and off my whole life. I just didn't have the vocabulary to know what it was and to have that understanding of what it was. Um, but, you know, these people that I started running with, they became close friends. And we all know that when you're out on a run for a couple hours, it just creates this really unique space that you, it's hard to find in other places where uh, you can just talk about life. And yeah, I always say you can learn more about a person in a two hour run than you can like, I don't know, going out for several drinks or something like that. Um, so it was at this point, I started gaining this vocabulary and understanding what depression was. And along the way, in the timeline, 2018 is when Sasquatch trail running, uh, got off of the ground. So that's the trail running group that I'm a race director for. And it was those friends that I was plugged in with, with the trail community that helped me get Sasquatch growing. Um, so a couple of years later, it's now 2021. Uh, I was going through one of these depressive stretches. And the thing that was different was that now I had this community in my life and these friends who were not going to tolerate me just retreating into a black hole and isolating from other people. And so these friends were really encouraging me to, to just take a second and think about maybe it's time to finally get some help. And I had every single excuse possible of why I didn't want to get plugged in with therapy. Um, you know, the time it involved uh, insurance, finding somebody, blah, blah, blah. I had all these excuses. And it was then that I got connected with Bigger Than the Trail. And as Sarah just described, uh, the process really takes out all of those excuses. I went on their website and I was a little disappointed to find out like all you had to do was fill out a questionnaire and then you'd be, you'd be partnered with a therapist. Um, so I did that and I thought, oh, it's going to take a few weeks to get linked up. And then it was like a few hours later that I got an email saying like, congratulations, you've been paired with a therapist. Um, so it was at that point that, you know, I think when you look back in your life, you can see certain moments that are really uh, kind of a turning point. And that for sure was a big turning point in my life. This was the first time uh, that I was ever getting connected with therapy. It was the first time I was digging into uh, family issues, understanding what depression is, understanding that it's okay to talk about these things. Um, and one of the biggest things that Sarah already touched on was I learned what I had been using as a coping strategy was running. And running can only take you so far. Um, and the more you run, the more likely you are. I mean, it's not a guarantee, but you're probably going to experience an injury at some point. And then when that happens, you don't have running. And uh, that's what I learned through therapy was that running is a great tool to use, um, but it can never be the whole solution uh, for a problem. And so uh, that was really transformative to go through that experience. Um, later that year, I was training for the Tahoe 200 race. Like I said, you just, you know, keep running further. So why not run 200 miles? Um, and I was keeping a YouTube vlog and I had kind of gone like radio silent the, those, you know, five, six months because of all these things were going on. There was so much, there was still a lot of like shame and stigma surrounding uh, the therapy that I was getting involved in and the antidepressant I was on. And again, it was the community that I was plugged into, the friends that were supporting me that were kind of 
you know, encouraged me, hey, why don't you share your story? And uh, you never know what's going to happen when you do that. And so I put a video online on YouTube and the outpouring of support was unbelievable uh, that happened after that. There were runners in my own local community in Sasqua that were reaching out. Strangers on the internet were reaching out, dropping notes. And um, the coolest part about it was that people were sharing that what I had shared was really resonating with them, that they too were using running as a coping strategy. It wasn't working. And uh, many of them said that they were then going to get help through Bigger Than the Trail. And that was really the first time that I saw that like, there really doesn't need to be stigma and shame around these issues of mental health. Because when you share your story, it really opens the door for other people to have a conversation. And it creates this safe space uh, and something that was so hard for me to do, uh, it just really opened the door to all these new connections with runners that I didn't have before. And I want to share a little part of an email that I got from a runner, because I think as, uh, you know, as a runner, as a race director, it could be helpful. A woman reached out. She's become a close friend. Uh, she's in our community. She said that you can now be a leader in ways that you couldn't be before. And don't take that for granted. P.S. Take your meds, uh, which is also very helpful advice. Uh, but I want to use that as a segue to tie all this back in to race directing. Um, at Sasquad, our mission statement is to welcome all people's paces and ages to our events. Um, and I think that this whole mental health journey is really uh is really tied back to that mission and has really powered that. Uh, like I said, I was totally a lone wolf when I started running. And now as a race director, because of the experiences I've had and how transformative community has been, it's a huge focal point to make sure that everyone who comes to our races feels welcome and feels safe. And especially those runners who are coming alone. I can spot them from a mile away where they're like kind of moseying around a picnic table by themselves. Uh, really try to make a, a concentrated effort to make them feel seen and make them feel known. Uh, and so one of the main ways that we do this at Sasquad is through our volunteers. And we've coined the, the term, the volunteer dream team. That's what we call anyone who comes out to help at our events. Uh, because when you think about it, your volunteers are most, almost always nine times out of 10, they are the first point of contact that a runner and a hiker has when they come to your race. So in my mind, it's so critical for those volunteers to be 100% on board with our mission and to understand what we're trying to do. Uh, so we've started sending out a volunteer guide with the PDF. And in that we talk about how uh, important it is for everybody to feel welcome and how important it is for them to play a role in that. And it's just, it's cool because this has seemed, it's just been an organic thing where it's attracted uh, incredibly amazing, authentic individuals. Um, and it's kind of this ripple effect where these people are getting plugged in and they're making an impact on the runners that are coming to our races. And it just goes full circle with more and more people getting involved. Um, and the other thing as a race director, a tangible thing that could be helpful for others is that I always try to remember that you never know what a runner is going through in their personal life when they come to an event. And I say that from experience, like I said, like I would show up to these races and like try to avoid talking to people because it was easier just to smile and pretend that everything was fine. Um, so that's something that I try to remember is that maybe this runner that is on the starting line, like they're in the thick of depression. And this is like the only human act interaction that they're going to have is at this race. And so that's, I think has been really helpful to just be so intentional with the interactions that I have as a race director. And then also, again, bringing it back to the volunteers of really uh, impressing upon them how important it is to make everybody feel welcome. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is that our races uh, are growing a ton. We've had uh, a few of our events pushing 300 runners selling out. 
And uh, I know there's races out there that have thousands of people. And I'm not saying that's bad at all, but for us with Sasquad, we have been putting caps on our events to keep them small because uh, what we've been finding is it's really hard for for us to keep interacting with these runners and making sure there's that personal touch when the events keep growing. And that does create a little bit of a dilemma, right? As a race director, especially it's my full-time job. So there is that, that kind of pull and tug of, well, you're capping a race. So that means less revenue. But what I've seen over the last couple of years is that the benefits of growing the community is it far outweighs maybe that extra revenue that you could have from just having unlimited registrations, not to mention all the other organizational things that come with having a huge event. Um, but I think, you know, we want to be around for a long time. So having the races have a really strong community is something that's really important to us. Um, and then also too, is just being really in touch with the demographics that come to our events. You know, we've, we, we do have some competitive runners that come out uh, but the vast majority of these runners and hikers are, they're doing it for fun. They're doing it as a stress relief. They're mid to back of the packers. Uh, and so we've decided that we're expanding as much as we can, the cutoff times for our events. And I'm, we're doing that because the feedback I received from talking to people uh, out on the trail, a lot of hikers, they'll say, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to come to a race. There's not enough time for me to finish. And so when we've expanded our cutoff times, it's allowed more people to get involved in our races. And this ties back to mental health, because I think what, you know, Sarah just mentioned before is that there's a, more and more people who are trying out trails and getting outside and getting active uh, because they're hoping it can enhance and benefit their mental health. So there she is. If we could provide, um, you know, if we could provide a space, space and provide that community that people are looking for um, by making our cutoff times a little bit longer, then that's for sure worth it. So uh, that's a little bit I have. Uh, we, you know, we fundraise for Bigger Than the Trail. That was very, very important to me to continue to give back with our events. Um, and yeah, I think that's uh, that's the story here, Terry. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. Kim, thank you so much. Um, appreciate everything that you said there, and uh, um, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty clear why uh, why you're selling out your races. <laughs> very good, very good. Claude, okay, my man. Okay, so, sorry to keep you waiting so long here, but uh, but appreciate your patience. So um, so Claude, um, yeah, tell us about um, tell us about your story because you've got a um, uh, a very different story from uh, from some of the others that we've heard. But uh, um, over to you, man. Uh, thank you. Uh, all good. Uh, we're used to queuing out here in the UK, so. <laughs> um, um, also my journey with running uh, uh, started um, kind of uh, a long time ago in, in terms of, uh, I, I was, I, I think, uh, it started in Rwanda, basically. So I, I, I in the UK, I'm a refugee. Um, I, I came here as a refugee to German mum as part of um, family re reunification after the genocide. That happened in Rwanda. I was four years old, and me and my mum were the only people that survived out of my direct family, basically. And my mum came here to receive uh, treatment, um, and then later I was able to come here to join her. Um, so growing up in the UK with that kind of stuff as my starting block, really, uh, in, into life and in, in a safer, uh, more prosperous, uh, prosperous countries, I felt. A lot of my youth, uh, I felt um, like there was a lot of pressure on me to do something with my life. Um, and I couldn't cope with the pressure as much as so I tended to just try to do as much as I could to impress everyone, um, but not um, have any idea of what it is I actually wanted out of my life. Um, so uh, one of the things I did was go to go to university as quickly as possible um, as that was the one thing coming from an African background that's the one thing that your parent wants out of you go to university get a good education get a good job and support the rest of the family so I chose uh, the only course that I knew of so I, I, I was um, I was into sports I wanted to do sports so I thought I'll just choose sports uh, at university uh, I'll probably enjoy that um, but what I found 
um, as soon as I started university that university just wasn't for me. Um, I really didn't enjoy being so far away from my family. I also didn't really enjoy just being in an environment uh, where uh, I was doing a course which I, I didn't, although I enjoy sports, I didn't really like studying about sports. Um, and so I dropped out of, of university, came back to London, um, and obviously, again, like I mentioned, coming from an African background, that's a huge embarrassment point uh, from African parents. Your, your child went to university, you told everyone he's going to university, he's dropped out of university. Um, caused a lot of friction between me and my, uh, and my mom uh, to a point where at 19 years old I just decided to leave the house without any plan of where I was going to go or what I was going to do um, and um, that was when I became uh, homeless. Um, through the UK, if you've been to the UK, um, um, there, there are supports uh, put in place for people who are experiencing homelessness uh, but they're, they're, they're very um, the caveats, the, the, the places that you need to, the boxes you need to tick in, in before you can actually receive any support. Uh, one of those uh, reasons why that I wasn't able to receive any direct support uh, is I was a healthy young male. Um, those, I wasn't in danger of uh, anything. Um, so I was basically told, there's nothing we can do for you, but here's the two leaflets uh, of organizations that may be able to help you. Um, so I took one of them. Um, which was uh, a youth uh, organization that helps uh, young people who are experiencing homelessness and also looking to get into educational employment. It was really close by to the um, to where I was, uh, so I decided to just go on and, and see, you know, if they could help me. Um, because I was uh, I was I was still a refugee. Uh, with any uh, Somali document was a refugee passport. I had lost that. Um, throughout the whole process of being homeless that could really prove who I was. Uh, so no one could actually help me. So um, I ended up spending um, about a year, eight months, uh, basically being street homeless. Um, and then um, another six months living in sh night shelters. Um, throughout the whole process uh, of being homeless, I completely lost um, uh, who I was as a, as a person. Um, I used to be very confident and I, 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 I felt like I used to be very outgoing and I knew how to ask for help. I knew how to approach someone to ask for help. I lost all that because, um, first of all, um, you lose friends pretty quickly um, when, when you're experiencing the stuff I was, I was going through. Um, there's a shame and a stigma attached to being homeless. homeless. Uh, a, a lot of the time uh, it feels like that society is telling you it's your fault, you're the reason you become lost, you did something wrong to be where you are. Um, so you tend to, you know, go, go within yourself um, and not try to bother anyone and what and actually enjoy the fact no one can really see you um, because you didn't want to you don't want to stick out because uh, then you have to explain that you're homeless. Um, so I, I became very um, depressed and um, looking for quick and easy ways to escape uh, my reality, uh, which involves a lot of drug taking, uh, a lot of drinking. Um, it's funny when you're homeless and you haven't got any money or roof, drugs are very easy to find. It was, it was a weird thing. Um, um, and I, 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 after about, Eight months of, or six months, sorry, of, of being uh, in, in that shelter. So I was really, I was really ready to accept that um, that maybe I wasn't never going to be um, not homeless. I, I was. Uh, this was going to be my future. I, I started to see myself in um, other people, uh, other homeless people in the streets who have been um, homeless for a very long time. Um, and I was ready to accept that maybe this is, you know, this is how my life was meant to turn out. Um, through accessing the day center I told you about um, uh, before, um, one of the uh, sports worker there actually is the co-founder of the running charity. So this was before the running charity was ever an idea. Uh, the other co-founder, James Gilly, um, came down to basically speak to us about uh, getting a bunch of young homeless people to run the London Marathon. Um, we all said no, uh, there's no way of running London Marathon. Uh, running just, wasn't a sport any of us were really interested in. We didn't really see ourselves in any other runner out 
um, you know, on, on a street, um, which, which is, it, it didn't feel like our sport. Um, he, you know, told us a story about, you know, he lost a friend uh, through um, a drug overdose who then later found out he was actually homeless himself. Um, and that resonated with me a little bit because uh, he basically described who, who I was. Um, and I was scared that maybe I was going to end up like his friend. Um, and through that story, I, I, I decided to, I had nothing less to lose really. And uh, this is something that was being offered to me. Um, and I, I will just give it a go. And another reason why I gave it a go is um, the, new, uh, the new center I was, I was accessing closed at 4 p.m. and the night shelter opened at 6 p.m. And there was an hour in between, you know, or two, or two hours in between where the sessions were, were going to be running where I could guarantee I'd have a roof over my head. And that's all. On, honestly, one of the only reasons why I decided to actually do it. Um, through accessing like, the sessions, what I quickly, um, what I quickly learned was, um, first of all, I was in a group of similar young people like myself got, uh, struggling through similar situations and we were just in a room in a hall or in a, or in, in a park or somewhere just running, exercising. And for the first time ever, I wasn't Claude the homeless guy, I was just Claude. Um, I, I didn't have any, any stigmas attached to anything I was doing. I, in fact, everything I was doing, people were saying I was positive. Like, oh, well done, he just done a, a lap uh, of, of, a, of, a, of a track. Oh, well done, you know, for turning up and actually taking part. Um, and, and slowly, just every, every, I was starting to look forward to coming to the sessions because it's the only time I can leave all my baggage behind and then have an hour or two hours of just exercising and feeling good afterwards. And then when I have to pick up my baggage again, they felt a little bit lighter. Um, and I was, again, already planning about, you know, the following week, the following day, Am I going to be able to exercise? Am I uh, you know, speaking to the coaches, asking for tips of, of how to get faster, how to get fitter? Um, and then I was introduced to park run um, as, uh, as, as my first ever official run. Um, I know park run is not really that official, but it was like the first mass participation event I took part in. Um, and I remember hating every single second of that. Um, it was, uh, I don't know if any of you've been to if, you, if you've been to London. There's a park called Hampstead Heath, and it's, if you're going to choose um, a park to run in for your first ever time in London, don't choose Hampstead Heath. It's hilly. Um, it was it was cold. It was wet. Um, I walked like seventy percent of it, and by the time I finished, I spoke to Alex, who was the other co-founder, and I said, "Do you know what? This running thing is not for me. Um, I hated every single bit of it." Um, Alex sat me down. Um, and basically said, no, that's fine, I get it. Um, um, let's put some, before you decide to complete, completely quit, um, let's write some things that you'd like to achieve in the next month, um, whether it be running, personal stuff, um, employment stuff, anything, just write it down, and then we're going to make our mission to try and achieve at least one or two uh, or three things from your list throughout this month. One of the First thing I chose, obviously, um, to get a faster time in the park run because it was like 45 minutes. And I was like, that's, that's not right. I, 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 wanted, I, I wanted to run faster. Um, and, the other, and the other things I wanted to do was the more practical stuff. I wanted to you know, find somewhere uh, with a roof over my head. I wanted to um, find work. Um, and then throughout that month, that's all, that's all we did. I turned up to train. After training, I sat down on the keyboard session with Alex and I put down goals that I, I needed to reach for Monday uh, all the way to the following week. And for the first time since I was homeless, I was able to think about the future. When you're homeless, everything is immediate. Where are you going to speak? Where are you going to eat? You know, are you safe? Are you not safe? Everything is very like now, now, now. And that, for the first time, I was able to take a pause and actually think about where do I want to be in a week's time, in a month's time, in a year's time. Um, and I really sort of took, uh, took to those goals. I, I, I actually really enjoyed setting goals and, and achieving goals. And for the first time, I felt like, since I was homeless, I felt um, like I can do anything because I would wake up on, uh, on a Monday and I, and I print out CVs and on, on, on the same day I would hand them out to 
so many different uh, places. Uh, on a Tuesday, I'll come to train and just, I'll, I'll go for a run. Again, that's something positive. And now we, we that confidence again from that activity then reinforces uh, that confidence within myself to go to like a housing provider and be like, I need a house. How can I get a house? Um, what, what do I need to do to get a house? So for the first time ever, I, I, I regained that confidence again where I could ask someone for help. I can look at someone in the eye and say, this is what I deserve. And how can I make sure that I get this one thing that I deserve? Um, and by the time I graduated the program, um, or the, the, the first initial pilot program of the running charity, by the time I graduated there, I was privately renting, working two jobs, um, also volunteering for the running charity. Um, and so I was, um, I was working, it was strange, I, I was working for the cabinet office, which is like um, in the government of, of him in, in the UK, um, doing data analysis, um, which something that an award, which I never thought I'd ever get opportunity to, to be in, but through just the confidence of putting myself in a, in a room where I, I, I felt like I, just, I can get that, that job, I can do anything. And that stemmed from literally going from, um, you know, entering a room where I can exercise and feel good about myself. And then that translating into going to a park run, um, second time I'm going to a park run and then running, running 25 minute park run. And then that confidence that gained from that and then took me into like job interviews and me feeling confident in myself because I've, because I've, because for the first time ever, I can look back and be proud of all the things I've achieved um, in, in a long time. And um, in, on the back end of the London Olympics, um, Alex told me that there, there could be an opportunity for me to be a program officer for the running charity. And yeah, I bit his hand off really. I was like, 100% want to do that. Um, I, and as much as I, you know, like the you know the posh title of and you know, working for the cabinet office and everything that came with it. What what I really wanted to do in my life um, after um, I went through what I went through with the money charities. How can I give this back to someone else? Um, and volunteering was definitely a part of it, and I really enjoyed that. Um, but to be in a situation to to be in that situation where that could be my full time job, uh, to literally uh, to engage with as many young people going through the exact same thing I was going through. Or even worse, um, and then to, but then to give them um, a the tool. The running is just a tool, as has been mentioned before. Running is a tool. Um, there are other things around that we do: the youth work, the advocacy, the everything that we do. That's the important part. But the running allows um, the young person to believe that they deserve all these things that they should be getting from society anyway, um, and. Yeah, and um, that was oh, that was like seven, eight years ago now uh, since I started working for the Royal Charity. And um, now I, I manage a program in London. Um, and yes, yeah, it's been a massive full circle with, with running. Um, I've done two marathons and I actually enjoy running marathons now. I haven't gone quite into ultras. I feel like you need to be slightly crazier to take on an ultra. Um, but I'm working on it. I'm working on it one day. Um, yeah, that's uh, my story. Brilliant, Claude. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I, I think you might have an ultra in your future. You never know. I mean, they never, uh, never see. Never I think see. every every day, every day, um, someone tells me about an ultra marathon. I'm like, oh, maybe. But then I think about a distance. I'm like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> well, it's uh, all it can take is is one moment, um, and and our perceptions can change, can't they? You know, it's, it's like. We can go from this isn't for me to this is who I am, you know, and, and why, why, let, let's give it a go. What's the worst that can happen? You know, maybe I don't finish. You know? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but like, it, it is funny because I went from a 5K to dreading a 10K to doing 10Ks on a regular basis to dreading a half marathon. And that half marathon is probably my favorite distance now to running marathons. So uh, you never know. I, Fifteen yeah. mile coming soon. There we go. Well, <laughs> Claude, what a long way you've come. Um, talking talking about long ways, we've uh, we've run over a bit on time. But uh, um, uh, before before we go, um, uh, Sherb, I don't know if you're still out there or not, but uh, uh, my colleague Robert Sherburn um, had a question, 
And um, he was saying, um, uh, Mother Nature gets much credit for the beautiful landscapes we can access. But how does it feel to see a simple sign along a course indicating how far to the next aid station or checkpoint? What are your thoughts on including other inspirational messages along a trail or course that brings mental health into focus in a therapeutic way? Something perhaps created for and by those dealing with mental health issues, be it a slogan, a quote, or an image that tells a story. And, and Chris, thank you, you, you answered this. So um, this actually came up in my mind earlier this week when working on new directional and advisory sites. As you say, great idea to find out what people need to hear out on the course rather than what we think they need to hear. Yeah, um, Kim, I, I had a question for you. I, I, I know this is kind of putting you on the spot, but uh, um, uh, is, <laughs> did you have any thoughts on, I, hopefully you heard the question okay, but um, did you have any thoughts on that in terms of inspirational signs around the course? Is that, is that something that you've done um, or is that something that, uh, um, that you're planning to do? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic idea. We're we're doing our first 100 miler this September, and that's something we've already been talking about. Uh, we didn't have the idea for signs, but one of the, the aid station captains had the idea of giving out kind of like little tokens um, that have a note on them, something like that. So, you know, you see a runner who's maybe in the pain cave, you know, you could pass them this little note. Um, I think it's a fantastic idea and it's a great opportunity, especially if somebody's running a hundred miles, they're going to pass that sign a lot of times. <laughs> true. True. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Well, it's time to, to wrap it up. It, it feels like we've, uh, we've covered a lot of ground in a, um, in a short period of time. And, uh, um, yeah, thank you to, uh, to Anna, to Chris, to Kim, to Claude, to Malcolm, um, and to uh, and to Sarah as well. Um, looks like she's had to drop off now. But uh, um, and thank you to everybody out there for uh, uh, for hanging with us as well. And uh, um, and then for for everybody that gets to see this uh, uh, this recording um, uh, after the event. Then uh, um, yeah, we look forward to, uh, um, to hopefully we've uh, provided some some really great content to uh, to inspire you to reach out to your mental health communities and. Uh, um, yeah, we're doing some amazing work out there. I mean, you you guys have uh, um, uh, yeah just blown me away with uh, um, with everything that you're doing. So thank you so much for for your time here. And uh, um, yeah, Claude, it's uh, time time to time to enjoy the uh, the nighttime evening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have you still got rain there, or is that? Uh, no, it's finished. Now. It's, uh, it's nice sunset. Okay. Okay. Um... All right. So, so Kim, you've got the afternoon ahead of you, but for, for Mal, Chris and Anna, then you've got the day ahead of you pretty much. So uh, yeah, the sun, the sun's come up during this conversation yet again, Terry, yeah. I think every time we talk, the sun's coming up, we start <laughs> in the dark and it's the day. <laughs> uh, well, well, must be a different side of Christchurch to me, Anna. <laughs> it's still dark over it. Up. Oh, definitely not out of the dark now. Uh, <laughs> bless you. Bless you. Thank you so much. Um, take care, everybody. I'm going to uh, I'm going to stop the recording now.